Thank you, Erica. I'm Aditi, and I did my research in the Rothman Lab under the mentorship of Sagan Peterson. So as we begin our final talks for the next two days, I want to begin by showing the image of how life begins. This is sperm fertilizing the egg. And we all may be familiar with this image um, in that it shows how life begins, but it also shows how genetic lineages are sustained. When egg and sperm come together, they pass down genetic information to create the next generation. So in this way, we, living bodies, are simply messengers or information carriers that contain the genetic information for a transient amount of time, but long enough to pass it down to the next generation of messengers and information carriers. So while we are mortal, the germline, which is the tissue that's associated with egg and sperm, forms an immortal link connecting us to our ancestors and our ancestors to the future little ones to come. The genetic information in these germ cells, egg and sperm, is housed in the nucleus and mitochondria. Mitochondrial DNA is inherited maternally, unlike nuclear DNA, which has a Mendelian inheritance pattern, which is why we inherit partly of our DNA from mother and partly from the father's side. And the mitochondrial genome is also much smaller than the nuclear genome. However, the proteins that it encodes are essential for energy production, growth, and survival. So if mutated forms of mitochondrial DNA are inherited through the maternal germline, this can give rise to devastating diseases that affect energy production, growth, and survival. This is two-year-old Will Martin. He has inherited mutated forms of mitochondrial DNA and has Lay's syndrome. So he experiences seizures, lack of motor control, and is expected not to live past his seventh birthday. And while we don't have cures for Lay's syndrome or, or the more general mitochondrial myopathies, we do have, a, have several hypotheses of how they may be caused, and we know that the body is resilient. So within our lifetimes in our bodies, we have several mechanisms in the germline that eliminate mutant mitochondria and mutant mitochondrial DNA from the germline. And the umbrella term for this is called purifying selection. So we aim to study purifying selection and in this way go beyond the physical manifestation of disease or the disease phenotype and uncover the genetic causes and the molecular mechanisms associated with it. And in this way, build a bridge connecting the physical to the genetic and molecular. So we hypothesize that purifying selection involves the step in the germline of cell death, or apoptosis. And as you can see, in the germline of the C. elegans, which is the nematode we study, there's a step where uh, there's a death zone. So 97% of the cells that are developing to become potentially, to potentially become oocytes or eggs are killed off. So perhaps in this step, the 97% of cells that are killed off contain mutated mitochondrial DNA or mutated mitochondria, leaving only a handful of cells to actually develop into oocytes and pass down healthy mitochondria. So we ultimately aim to, do, to understand the efficiency at which this purifying selection occurs, and so we will develop a rate. To do this, we'll microinject healthy, or what I will refer to as wild-type mitochondria, into the germline of a strain that only contains mutated mitochondrial DNA. And then we'll select for the progeny that has uptaken this wild-type, or healthy, mitochondrial DNA, and track throughout subsequent generations the levels of both types of mitochondrial DNA using a process called qPCR, which is a PCR reaction in which the amplified product is measured after every cycle, so in real time. And the <coughs> amount of DNA can be quantified by a light emission or a fluorescence um, from a fluorophore. So before we can understand this qPCR experiment, we need to develop a selection condition. So that's what I've been doing this summer. Ideally, we want to select for the worms that have uptake in this wild-type mitochondrial DNA and um, select against the ones that have mutated forms. So we might see something like this, where the ones that have healthy mitochondrial DNA can grow on a selected medium, but the ones that have mutated ones can not So we expose two the two different strains, mutant and wild-type, to different drugs and conditions that affect the mitochondrial respiratory chain in hopes that perhaps we will see a differential growth effect. 
And with chloramphenicol, which is a broad spectrum antibiotic that inhibits mitochondrial protein translation, we see that throughout a range of concentrations, the wild type or the healthy strain grows or has a higher percent survival than the mutated strain. And since this is a selection condition, we want to see ideally a very strong difference. And so now our next step is, although this looks promising, we want to optimize the drug selection condition. So we'll narrow down at which concentration we see the greatest difference and possibly combine it with other drugs that also show promising subtle effects. Secondly, we want to understand what genes are involved in purifying selection and germline apoptosis. So our reasoning is we'll knock out a gene we think is involved and see if this is coupled with a change in the rate of purifying selection. And the first gene we want to test is SED3. And this encodes a pro-apoptotic protein that directly promotes germline apoptosis. So uh, we needed to create a double mutant, which had a mutation in the SED3 nuclear gene, which made it non-functional, as well as in the mitochondrial DNA. So we capitalized on the two different inheritance modes of nuclear DNA and mitochondrial DNA and created a cross to obtain a fraction of our progeny with the desired genotype in the second generation. And we were able to confirm after two generations which progeny had this desired genotype using PCR and sequencing. So here we see that these bands indicate all the F2s have their mitochondrial deletion inherited from their mother. And these bands indicate successful amplification of the SED3 gene through PCR. And then this was later sent into sequencing, Sanger sequencing, to understand which ones exactly had the mutation in it, making the protein, the gene non-functional. And we also think that purifying selection is not only occurring during germline apoptosis, but during early embryo cell divisions. So when the egg, when the egg is fertilized, the embryo becomes its only one cell. Then it goes through a series of cell divisions to become two cells, four cells, eight cells, and eventually a fully differentiated adult. And during these initial cell divisions, the mitochondria segregate to different sides. And we think this, that possibly the healthy mitochondria segregate to the posterior end of the embryo because ultimately that will be differentiated to create the germline. So the way the mitochondria segregate initially in these initial cell divisions influences the health of the germline and the health of the progeny that it will create. And so to study this, we need a way to visualize the mitochondria during this stage. So I'm creating a mitochondrial GFP fusion construct um, using classical cloning. So here we see our uh, that insert that contains our genes of interest, the GFP sequence and the mitochondrial localization sequence. So our GFP is will be localized to the mitochondria. So we cut out this gene of interest and ligated it into the reading frame of our vector, which contains the PI1 promoter. And the PI1 promoter is significant because it ensures the genes will be transcribed in the germline and during these initial embryo cell division stages, which is where we want it to be expressed. So now our step is to verify if we have actually successfully ligated it and come up with the plasma construct that we want. And then microinject it into um, a, a C elegant strain and see if we have fluorescence in vivo. So ultimately, we narrowed down some possibilities for potential drug selection conditions, and we're just working towards developing the most optimal drug selection condition. We've also created the double mutant strain, which can be stored and later used for the qPCR experiments, and to determine if SED3 is involved in germline apoptosis and purifying selection. And then we want to verify our, if we have our plasmid construct made, and we'll later microinject it and observe for fluorescence, which will prove a very useful tool. So finally, I'd like to finish by acknowledging Professor Joel Rothman for his guidance in the lab and for providing this tremendous research opportunity. Um, my mentor, Sagan Peterson, for her invaluable mentorship and guidance in the lab and for making a very uh, great learning experience. Um, the coordinate program coordinators, Dr. Erica Lubin, Dr. Maria Napoli, um, Kevin Moore, for making this a very uh, stimulating summer and for fostering this consilience approach in the summer research experience. Thank you.